So, hello, Kitchen Lobster. Hi, how are you? I mean, hello, lobster, good, you also, question mark, question mark? <laughs> Pretty good. Um, let's see, what is my robot name? Uh, I... I cannot go to the pumpkin ball. I cannot go to the pumpkin ball with you. Yeah. So normally uh, there would be sounds of phone dialing and whatnot. But we don't have to do that today because you're in my basement. It's true. Which is not as creepy as it sounds. <laughs> it's almost as creepy as it sounds. <laughs> So this is the Love You Like Crazy podcast where yes. we talk about young adult fiction. And uh, this episode we have read possibly the most fucked up young adult fiction that has ever been, well, published. Not necessarily written, but definitely published. Could you tell us a little bit about this, Jacob? Sure. The name of the book is Grasshopper Jungle. It's Andrew Smith's seventh novel. Published in 2015, 416 pages. 416 pages of what the fuck am I reading? Yes. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that a bunch and when there'll be a lot of spoilers and, and a lot of swearing. <laughs> yeah, you may, have, you may have guessed. And then, uh, next time we get together, we're going to talk about, um, the second book in a series that we've already started. Uh, we're going to do the subtle knife. Is that right? Yeah. We're going to do the subtle knife, which is the second book in the, his dark material series by Philip Pullman. We did the first book, which was uh, The Golden Compass, not that long ago. So it's time to revisit some old friends and meet some new ones. Yes. But first, we're going to talk about a very strange book that may be very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to explain this book without you know, saying that the basic plot of the book is um, two male teenagers, one female teenager. They're the, the main characters. Uh, the two male teenagers brought about the end of the world with a plague that turns people into bear-sized praying mantises. Praying mantises, according to the book, want to do only two things, one of which is eat, the other of which is mate. Uh, yes, I think the word used in the book is fuck. It's used a lot in the book. That's true. But I was trying to be nice. You could do one of those word clouds and like the big, you know, where the, they... The biggest word would be fuck. That would be there. Um, horny. Wh horny would be uh, high on the list. Uh, idea. Yeah. Let's see. So the main characters are Austin Zerba. I, I think it's Zerba. Zerba. Uh, Robbie Breeze. And then Shan Collins. Shan and Austin have been dating since seventh grade. Right. And they're currently, what, in 10th grade? They're currently in 10th grade in the, uh, the Catholic school, not the Catholic, the Lutheran school. Right. Catholic bad, Lutheran good, according to this book. Um, or at least no, ac according I, to the headmaster. Oh, yeah, true. The, the headmaster, who turns out, is also gay. He, he is also I gay. I say also gay. We haven't Because uh, Robbie Breeze, uh, Austin's best friend, um, is gay. Yeah. Austin, not sure if he's attracted to Shan or Robbie as his as his main squeeze, uh, but both at, at very least equally-ish. Yeah, that causes him to be very confused. So they, they've basically been connected, the three of them, since seventh grade. Uh, Robbie and Austin were best friends. Austin was, you know, had a crush on Shan or was very interested in her. And, and Robbie is the one who taught Austin how to dance and then went over and to Shan and said, Austin is really interested in you, but he's very shy, but he would like to dance with you. And so then they dance. Um, and but they then, didn't get together until later because they both uh, liked the book, The Chocolate War. Right. Which is a real book. Have you read it? I have. Oh, I, I don't feel really, like I have too, but I don't I remember. I think it's something I read like in middle school, maybe even younger, but I, I don't remember it. I just know I read it because I remember the, the cover of the book was, was chocolate brown. There you go. <laughs> That's what I remember most. But giant horny uh, praying mantises eat and fuck. So they eat lots of people. And as they reproduce, they eat more people. And the population human of, of the world goes down a, a lot, a lot, a lot as the bug population goes, goes way um, sky high. 
yay fucked up book. But uh, fortunately for the protagonists, Shan's uncle. It's hard to. Shan's stepfather's brother. Right. Was the scientist who made all of this. And therefore also had the bunker to live in forever. Right. Like it's this giant bunker with with supplies and food and everything for, you know, like 100 people. Yeah. And, and bowling alleys and movie theaters and all sorts of supplies under this town of Ealing, Iowa. Right. And books by male authors only. Well, that's really important <laughs> and 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 uh film strips of the uh the founder there uh encouraging everyone to just have have as much sex and have as many kids as possible to repopulate the earth yes anyway <laughs> yes so i don't know my notes more or less consist of a lot of lists which are not actually that useful uh but Oh, so the uh, I thought I might read the way the book begins. Yes. Uh, it's told from Austin's perspective. He's the narrator. He says, I read some... Already I've screwed it up. I read Fucking somewhere awesome. that human beings are genetically predisposed to record history. We believe it will prevent us from doing stupid things in the future. But even though we dutifully archived elaborate records of everything we've ever done, we also managed to keep on doing dumber and dumber shit. This is my history. There are th things in here. Babies with two heads, insects as big as refrigerators, God, the devil, limbless warriors, rocket ships, sex, diving bells, theft, wars, monsters, internal combustion engines, love, cigarettes, joy, bomb shelters, pizza, and cruelty. Just like it's always been. So, And all of those things are in this book? Yes. You know, that's not so different from what's on my website for when I try to describe <laughs> my music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, I thought it's a little, um, because like he's obsessed with history and he has this giant pile of notebooks in his closet that, uh, is basically as much as he can remember or say about yeah. his life and things he's learned, which this book is not part of. No. This is a different thing. It is and it isn't because he didn't bring all of his notebooks with him. Correct. I think he did. I think they oh, went back and retrieved them. Fuck, I don't remember this part. Um, okay, so he brought all the notebooks. So this is, I don't know, um, continuation of notebooks? But this is also still stuff he's not showing anybody. So one thing about Austin, and we've sort of touched on this in our, our brief discussions about this book before the podcast, was, you know, he says how reliable a narrator he is. Mm-hmm. And that makes him a completely unreliable narrator, in my opinion. Um, and I think the first paragraph that you just read sort of, you know, exemplifies that because he's telling you how important it is to talk about your history and write down your history. But it's all so unbelievable. And also, what's the point when you don't have a future? Who's going to read this? What is he writing this for? So... Do you think he's reliable? Do you think he's unreliable? Do you think he's a little bit of both? Do you think it matters at this point? Well, you know, it's also a little tricky because some of the things that he writes are obviously jokes. Like he's he's kind of got an an ironic teenager sense of humor, yeah. which some of us have never entirely grown out of. <laughs> um and he also says at one point something along the lines of that it's a historian's job to like fill in things when you don't quite have all the information you need to make the yeah. story work. But he also says, I have no reason to lie. Yeah. But there are like a lot of kind of gaps. Like he goes to this big fancy school. Do we know any of his classmates' names other than the Other three than Robbie names? and Shan. Like they just aren't even in it. Yeah. The only other people his age are in the books. Um, are bullies from a neighboring school who end up turning into giant bugs. Yeah. We know the the headmaster. Yeah. And that's because he sucks. Right. He we, uh, His dad is a teacher there. That's right. But yeah, I don't think we know any of the other people at, at the school. Right. Curtis Crane. Was that uh, the name yeah, of it? Yeah, Curtis Crane. Because they called it Candy Cane. Yep. Curtis Crane Lutheran Academy. The logo is embroidered crosses inside of blood red hearts. Um, 
I don't know why I wrote that down, but I did. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of blood imagery in this book and also a lot of actual literal a blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, I think he is the most unreliable narrator, but I also think the fact that, you know, he, he, he's right. He doesn't have any reason to lie. Like I have to just kind of go with it. I have to, at least at, at some level, believe what he's telling me, even though it's the most ridiculous fucking shit in the world. I think he's trying. You know, I think yeah. he tries, but he's also like a, by the time he's writing this, is, I think, kind of crazy because he's yeah. one of seven survivors. Yeah, he's a 20-year-old, I think, by the time he's writing it, because they, they're talking about their 21st birthday as being in the future. So they're around 20 and has been in the bunker since he was 17. Right. And also he's just like, I mean, I think that his time in the bunker has uh, exacerbated this, but he's also very, uh, you know, self-involved. I mean, like teenagers pretty much are, yeah, but uh, more so than most maybe. So it's filtered through yeah. that. I think he is in general trying to do his best to be honest and to record things accurately, but you know, I mean, he talks about how that's kind of impossible here and there. Would you like to talk a little bit about the science of this? I would love to talk about the science of this. <laughs> now so, that we've discussed that there are these giant man-eating praying mantises, would, you, would we like to talk about how this came about? I would. So um, did, did you see the movie Ant-Man? I did not. I saw that movie. I enjoyed that movie very much. But uh, after I saw it, I um, I came up with this thing that I said about it, which was that to say that the physics in Ant-Man don't make sense is an insult to nonsense because it doesn't like nonsense. I feel like even nonsense sort of follows rules, but the physics in Ant-Man do not. They just, <laughs> whatever, whatever is cool happens. Yeah. So in this, like, because there's a lot of things that I kind of buy, which is, that you would have a crazy industrialist in the, I guess, 50s and 60s, yeah. maybe into the 70s, who would stumble across something that seems like it has military applications and would work to develop it. Uh, and it would eventually turn out to be something that could destroy the world. I mean, that's that's not exactly the story of how nuclear weapons happen, but it's not so far off. Um, so that's kind of what I thought was happening when they find this underground bunker and they go in and there are these film strips that kind of explain what's going on. Which is very convenient, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yep. It's very convenient that they were there and it's very convenient that they knew where the fourth film would be anyway. Digress. Continue. Oh, yeah. No, there's, this is definitely like past Dickens level uh, <laughs> coincidence stuff like the Chan's step uncle is behind all this i mean just the fact that exactly how this happened was just like so ridiculously yeah. like if they had gotten beaten up anywhere else none of this would have happened right if, if they he, hadn't broken in the same night that the other kids broke in if he had decided to try to write in his blood on the ground like none of this would have happened but all of this happened because who knows? I don't know. Right. Anyway, it's so, it's a whole lot of yeah, Dickens um, level coincidence. So what happened was the uh the industrial uh what's his name? McCown? McKeown? Uh wait, what's oh Grady McKeown, we'll call him. That might be right. He uh developed this like he had these scientists they developed this thing where they took the sperm from grasshoppers, combined it with um, pollen from corn, and used it to fertilize corn. And then this made it grow really strong. And, and what else happened? If you ate the corn too much, your balls would dissolve. <laughs> Unstoppable corn! Right. So uh, they're like, okay, that's not really how things work. <laughs> But I, you know, I'm there so far. I'm like kind of willing to go with it. Um, okay, so you have the unstoppable corn, and uh, and they end up selling it to the government, who then use it to. Um, I think they give it to the the 
had a the premiere of China or something, yeah. whose balls then dissolve. The consequences of this are never made entirely clear. <laughs> and then uh, some mold starts growing on the corn. And they think the mold looks really cool and it glows in the dark. And so they try adding different things to it. And they eventually try adding Grady McKeown's blood to it. And what happens? At that point, it becomes yeah. infectious. <laughs> um Cats start attacking you. <laughs> uh, it becomes infectious, and um, Austin's what uh, grandfather? Yes, becomes the first person who's infected. And what happens when you're infected is you hatch into a giant praying mantis. Yes, that is not a thing. That is not how I. De- this this is not science. Th- this is say, not how the world works. <laughs> this is not science. What this is is. So there's a lot of talk about experimentation in this book. Um, and Aust- because Austin and uh, Robbie make out on the roof of um, a building, the, yeah. a, a mini mall. And Austin is confused and decides to talk to his dad about it. And his dad basically doesn't want to talk about it. So Austin says, you know, when you were when you were my age, did you ever like have sort of feeling? Maybe, maybe you experimented or – and his dad's like, experiment? Do you mean like in science class? <laughs> and Austin's like – Yeah. Yes. Yeah, dad. Austin thinks of an experiment in science class where they made uh, this goop using – what uh corn starch that looks like sperm he's like yeah pretty much and his dad says i once uh, made a battery out of a lemon so that's super useful so yeah. but i what, the reason why i think of that is just because that's the kind of like the science that you think of when you're in elementary school which is basically you have all these substances and you just sort of mix them together and hope that something cool happens yeah that's the story of science that that is and by the time we got to that point, I was like, oh, okay, that's that's what we're dealing with here. All right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is not in any sense real science. This is, you know, we're not, not – there's no place. real sense that this could actually happen in the real world, um, at least at that point. I was like, this is just its own crazy world that has nothing to do with how things actually work. But I feel like there is also a sense in which uh, – I. I think that one – so one of the things that Andrew Smith is saying in this book or maybe is having um, Austin say in the book is that, you know, people think that science is what rules the world, but a lot of it is just like random stuff that ends up being very destructive. Yeah. And the way the world will end will be maybe science has a part, but a lot of it will just be like people doing stupid things and bad things happening as a result. So it'll just be a lot of random coincidences that end up blowing up everything. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh-huh. We're, we're, you know, we're doing our best here. Yeah. You so may have noticed. One, one question uh, or one thing I want to, to talk about is also what happens to the, the person whose blood is added to the glowing mold. Oh, they become God. They become God. So the giant refrigerator-sized praying mantises won't touch them. They're actually a little afraid of them because they are part of that person. So since the mold and Robbie's blood mixed to become the, the new um, infection of these giant uh, man-eating uh, praying mantises. He is now God. So while Austin sort of thinks he is because he's the storyteller, mm-hmm. it's really Robbie who is completely untouchable by the yeah. things that can actually harm you. Right. Like the, I would say the most fun part of the book I thought was the part where they're like going out with pig guns f- full of his blood, filled with his blood, and they just go out and you know. Collect, you know, rescue people and shoot the giant bugs and yeah. whatnot. Like that's where, you know, that's kind of video, like a video game, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I guess they even say it's like a video game in the book, but it's like you know, there they're going out, they're getting things done. They come back, and then at the very end of it, they run into the you know, the giant ma- egg sac has hatched, and there yeah. are, it says there are more praying mantises than there are people in the state of Iowa. Yeah, because they, um, one of the 
the first bugs, uh, her, her first mission was to get as fucked as possible. Um, and, and, and fucked she got. Yeah. Her name had been Eileen. Right. And, uh, she, she got stuffed with, with lots of sperm from other, um, hungry, horny bugs. And then she found a house to lay said eggs in. So she filled the house. Like how one bug can fill a whole, like a whole house. That's a lot. But we're just going to go with the science here. We're going to go with it. Well, it it's, said like it was the first floor, wasn't it? Yeah. Just, just like covered. It's still a lot. Right. And they look like the, yeah. A um, lot. It is a lot. But we're going to go with it. So they were like, okay, we're going to go find these eggs and we're going to destroy them and we're going to save the world. Oh, fuck. We just missed it. Yeah. It was amazing because I was sort of rooting for them because I was like, oh, maybe they're, they are going to save the world. But there was a lot of pages to go. <laughs> so I guess I probably should have assumed that that was not going to happen. But I was still rooting for Robbie and Austin. Like, they're going to go. They've got these paint guns. And they're going to they're gonna save the world. This no. is not what happened, however. Instead, as Jake said... Those fuckers were hatching. And so then at that point, I mean, I forget if it's exactly specific, but they just hightail it back yeah. to the, They're the like, hatch. Yeah, I think they realized because, you know, the, the baby bugs were also eating other baby bugs and it was like mass chaos immediately. And they realized how outnumbered they were. And I think they, they may have done a quick calculation in their little teenage brains that kind of went like, Nope. Oh, shit. Gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's any significance to this, but so there are the seven people who are originally infected, and then there are seven people end up getting saved at the end. Um, I didn't even notice that. Good job. Hey, I noticed patterns. <laughs> That's what I do. Um. Well, let's see. So what was your favorite part of the book? My favorite part of the book was actually when they were figuring it all out. Mm -hmm. I really liked sort of watching Austin, you know, as, as a reader, sort of feeling Austin getting like more and more, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, fucking shit. Like... First, they watched the first film strip. Then they watched the second film strip. Then the third film strip. And then they're like, oh, shit. But they haven't really told anybody because they didn't tell Shan yet. But they're sort of like Robbie and, and Austin, their wheels are turning. They're figuring stuff out. They're not happy. But they, they realize, oh, fuck, we got to go find that that fourth film strip. And they know exactly where it is. It's on top of the mall uh, where... At the very beginning of the book, um, they coincidentally got in their, um, their skateboards and their sneakers thrown up there by the bullies who then uh, beat them up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so coincidentally, they knew exactly where to find it and went to go watch the last video and then was, you know, the, the final, oh, fuck. Because they realize that just yeah. like at the end, or not the end, but you know, like I was saying with the, the, the house full of baby bugs, you know, that that just deep, like inside your gut, like everything is awful and it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really fun to watch, <laughs> which yes. is horrible to say, but it was, it was, it was, it was well written in a way that like... I felt nervous for them. Mm -hmm. I felt that sense of anxiety, like, bitches, you got to figure this out now. Uh, my hands are flailing because I'm doing the same thing. Like, come on, guys, get it. Like, I loved that. Yeah. How about you? What did, what was your favorite part? Well, I want to say I enjoyed like when they go up on the roof um, of, I guess there's the tipsy cricket liquors. And from Attic to Cellar Consignment Store, which are owned by Shan's stepfather, uh, Johnny McKeown. Um, when they're up, when they go up there and they find this random collection of stuff, 
and it's like a you know like an old text adventure game like Zork or something where yeah. you're like oh hey look at this random collection of items I wonder if I'll need any of them later yeah. and the answer is all of them you know there's the plastic flamingo flamingo which turns out to be you know detect you know when the effect infection has gotten out yeah it, it can detect the mold uh, there's the bottles of screw top wine which aren't connected to anything but they do get drunk later and they do that doesn't work out so great there's the reels of film there's, there's the Lieber mask yep tell us how important the Lieber mask is the Lieber mask I mean, the Lieber mask that doesn't really end up getting used for a whole lot, but no, because at some point it's no longer useful. Right, but um, if you wear the Lieber mask, then people who have been infected with the virus, but who haven't yet sprouted, glow red, and everyone else glows blue. So if you glow red, you're going to turn into a bug. Um, and they find one on the roof, and then there are also a couple of other ones inside the bunker that didn't, don't smell. Don't terrible. smell as terrible. I also, like, I'm kind of a sucker for uh, the underground bunker made by some crazy person. Like, you know... Uh, we Do you were, kind of want one? Um, it seems like in order to make one, you just have to be crazy. But it would be kind of fun to find yeah. one. Like, that was something I always I enjoyed in the TV series Lost. Like, yeah. when, they, when they find the hatch and they manage to go in. And Well, some of the hatches are actually sort of nice and clean. And they're like, oh... Well, if you got to be stranded on this island, you might as well be here. Right. So I guess if you got to be, if it's got to be the end of the world somewhere, at least you've got food and shelter. And yeah. Give me shelter. Bowling alleys. Again, with the bowling alleys, Carrie. Yeah. Um, but you also have to be rich and crazy. Don't forget the rich part. Because sure. you can't build a cool bunker without being rich. Right. No, you would have to make it out of like bark and yeah. leaves. And it, that would do no good. That one is a not proof against regular insects, let alone <laughs> the the giant six or eight foot tall variety. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else did I like? Can so, I, can I uh, now talk a little bit about what an asshole? Well, Austin let me is? ask you. Okay. Let me ask you this okay. question. Because he's still an asshole, but I'll let you ask. Which character in the book did you hate least? Oh, <laughs> oh shit! This is the tough one. <sighs> Which one did I hate the least? I hated every single character in this book. So whenever I explain this book to people, and I I say, okay, just bear with me, y'all. Giant horny grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the book is deplorable. Check. Yet you won't hate it. Mm -hmm. So far, I'm, I'm, I'm ten for ten on this. Uh, people are, are are agreeing with me, but nobody in this book is likable. Um, I mean, maybe Sig isn't so bad. What's his, what's his full name? Is it? Uh, Awang Singh. Yeah, something like that. He's not horrible. I mean... He makes pancakes. He makes pancakes. That's cool. He has sex with uh, Robbie's mother. He sure does. I mean, Austin, Robbie, and Shan are all pretty terrible. Um, Grady McKeon, uh, he's the mad he's scientist. Johnny McKeon, he's, you know, not horrible. Right, he seems... But, I mean, he does bring about the end of the world, so there's that. He does bring he, about... He's the one who has uh, the globe of... And he, he, but the thing is, he doesn't know what it is. So when... I feel like if you ha find a globe that's labeled, uh, you know, what's it called? I think it's written. It's written in here. Let me find it. Let me find <laughs> it. Uh, contained MI Plague Strain 412E. I wouldn't yeah, keep that in my I office. <laughs> plague. The word plague means... Yeah. Do not touch. Do not open. Do not keep in my your poorly do not secured use as a office. Paperweight. Yeah. So it is a a sealed glass globe, uh, which is uh, unsealed. So let's see. Um, so I who was who were the survivors? Sig, Robbie's mother, Robbie's mother, um, Johnny, uh, Shan's mother, and then the three protagonists. Yeah. yeah so we're we're fine. I mean, Johnny Robbie's seemed... mother is pretty terrible. Yes. Austin's parents. You know, they're not in the second half of the book. Really? This is a YA novel where the parents aren't present? Surprise. Jeez. Huh? Shut up. Robbie's dad abandoned the family and ended up uh, in Brazil or someplace. And coincidentally was filming a volcano where the mad scientist Grady's plane was going down. Yeah. Because a book of coincidences. 
So to get back to the original question of who is the least horrifically bad character, I would go with um, Hungry Jack. <laughs> Hungry Jack is one of the bugs. Hungry Jack is a Vietnam veteran who's um, involved, who was involved in a My Lai massacre type yep. event. Least horrific character. Damn. I know. I hate Austin. Sure. I hate him. He's the worst. He's a terrible person. He's a terrible narrator. He's a shitty boyfriend to both Shan and Robbie. Let's just state it. He's a bad person. He's maybe not a terrible dad. Spoiler alert. Well, yeah. I think that's part of the case. That's one of those areas where you're like, maybe he's not entirely objective about this one. <laughs> but yeah, he's terrible. Um, Robbie is not the worst, but not the best because, you know, he, it's just, and Shan, she's whiny and kind of annoying. Uh, I feel bad for her in some instances because, you know, she really doesn't want her boyfriend to cheat on her, but she also. I mean, like when. She, uh, it's the end of the fucking world. Like, get over it. Yeah. I mean, they're. They're kind of products of their environment, which is, you know, they're they're raised in this very religious environment uh, in the with what is it Lutheran church? Is it that they all go to? Well, it seems like maybe she was, but I don't know about. I think Austin goes there because his dad teaches there, right? Not because they're religious, but because that's where his dad teaches. Um, I got the feeling that. Robbie might be like a scholarship kid. Mm. Maybe it's a better school than than the the local high school because you know he and his mom live in the worst apartments in town. Like they they keep talking about how like every day there's more eviction notices on the door of these yeah. these apartments. Um, and then there's Shan, and I think you know maybe her family is a little more legit where they've got some money. Right. Well, Johnny, I think. Is probably rich. Yeah, I think he's rich. I think his his brother left him a lot of money. Um, And also, he doesn't, you know, there's only so much going on in Ealing, Iowa, and he owns two out of the five businesses. Right. And it seems like the only two that make any money. Well, at least uh, the liquor liquor store. store. (laughs) So that's why I I think that maybe Austin and Robbie aren't products of of the religion, but I think maybe Shan is because... You know, a couple of times, like, you know, Austin tries to, you know, put the moves on Shan in a, in a more sexual way. And she's like, what? I don't I don't think so. Girl, good, don't girl. be silly. Don't is be what she silly. Says. And he's like, don't be silly. Oh, don't be silly. You're, you're being like, you're being weird, like a weird boy. And, oh, she, yeah. and he's like, weird boys? Normal boys think about sex. Right. And I, this is also another case where I think it's fair to kind of wonder to what extent that Austin is objective about them. Yeah. So maybe, maybe the way that he sees them is not the way that other people would. Um, but it seems like Shan seems like someone, you know, uh, Robbie and Austin stumble into a lot of stuff. Like they see Hungry Jack transform, but not because they are looking for him or anything. They just, just because happen, they, they just happen to have gone to the gay bar. Right. And they know where the uh, missing film canisters are, not because they have done any research, but because they just happen to have gone onto the roof of the place where they were. Yeah. Um, whereas Shan So is they get like, to be heroes. And they get yeah. to know all these things, but not... Because they're smarter. Right. And Shan is the one who's like, oh, I hear these weird noises in my wall. And gee, they happen exactly six hours apart. I wonder what's in there. You know, and then they find out that there's the teletype machine that warns that there's a uh, plague outbreak. And that says to go to the silo. And so she's the smart one, the the good Nancy Drew, yes. who goes to the library to find the plans of, of, of the old house that they'd moved into, which was the, the, the rich... Uh, step uncle's old mansion yeah. to find out that there in fact had been a silo on right. the property and where where is it? Right. Whereas Austin has been like, yeah, I'm sure that there's a silo there. We can all, you know, maybe it's camouflaged or something. You know, like he's yeah. a little bit of a dick he's about it. Stupid. <laughs> I hate him. He's the worst. 
Well, he's got he's got problems on his mind, apparently. Yeah. No, he's got sex on his mind. Well, that is and true. And he talks about it a lot. Yeah. I was like, I remember the first time I read it, I was like, is he bisexual or is he just incredibly horny? Or Yes. I think it's, uh, yeah. So I think column the answer a, is yes. Yeah. I think uh, he's open-mindedly sexual. So on page 21, there was a, a really interesting quote that I liked. And I thought that this sort of, uh, while it talks about Robbie... I think it sort of explains Austin too, because it's talking about, you know, another theme that comes up a lot in this book is eruptions. He talks yes. about eruptions a lot, volcanoes, because again, the volcano um, is what killed um, the, the mad scientist. The volcano is where Robbie's dad went to abandon the family, uh, but also the eruptions of, of teenagers mm-hmm. um, and the eruptions of, of bugs out of bodies, you know, a lot of eruptions. And he was talking about, you know, his own eruptions and, and then Robbie. And he said, there was nothing wrong with Robbie's volcano and he never did grow out of it. And I really liked that because, you know, he's just like, yep, my best friend's gay. He's always going to be gay. That's cool. I might be gay too. Don't know. And I, I liked that. I liked that it was not a thing between them. I mean, sometimes it was a thing between them because, you know, they made out. They were a little uncomfortable. They weren't sure how to talk about it. But I think for the most part, um, their friendship and their sexual tension was just sort of a thing rather than a big fucking deal. Mm-hmm. Um I think he made more of a big deal about Shan and, and their sort of supposed sexual tension because I think he sort of felt like, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. Like I'm supposed to have a girlfriend and I'm supposed to have sex with her. So I, th- I think he, he tried harder with Shan, whereas with Robbie, everything with their friendship was more natural and with their, with their, sexual relationship however um it may be in their current uh post apocalyptic present it's just it's comfortable so that's that's a quote i really liked and that that's something that sort of made me not hate austin mm-hmm. but also he's terrible yeah that's my big long speech about me me not not hating the worst character in the book, um, who I hate. <laughs> How's that? Could Very you good. Think? Yeah. Awesome. And I think, I mean, there is kind of a, uh, a poignance to when they go to the gay bar because Robbie says that he wants to see what his future is. Like if he stays in Ealing yeah. as a gay person, you know, how does that end up looking? And so he goes to this gay bar. It is, and, it's not pretty. No, it's very depressing, which... To be fair, it sounds a lot like probably it would have looked if they had gone to a straight bar in Ealing. <laughs> like, but uh, yeah, the fact that there is a gay bar in Ealing is not not too terrible. This Actually, I think it might be in the next, the town, next over. town over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah. So this book reminded me in uh, in a number of ways of Kurt Vonnegut. Do tell. <laughs> well. Maybe that's just too obvious. Like, you agree? <laughs> Can I admit something? Yes. I've never read any Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't judge, people. I... Don't judge. Maybe we just need to edit this out because this is an embarrassing thing to admit. <laughs> Man, all it's this weekend, uh, there have been a number of times when you were like, so have you seen? No. <laughs> I never have I never have read anything or seen anything. Okay. So it's uh Yeah, but come on, to to be a person of a certain age who reads a lot of books and has read a lot of books and will continue to read a lot of books. <gasps> and I've never read like anything by the guy who I should have read in high school, knowing what sort of books I like, i.e. Grasshopper Jungle. And I've read essays by him and, and he just seems like he's a nice guy a nice extremely depressed guy well that's okay that yeah. doesn't make him any less of a nice guy so anyway it reminds you of kurt Vonnegut. right well um one thing is that the sort of these sort of recurring phrases 
is something that current Vonnegut also does. Like in this book, you know, the sentence, it was not a good idea appears a number of times. And there are a few other ones. I don't, but you know what? A lot of times in this book, it was not a good idea. They did a lot of things that were not a good idea. Yes. No, it definitely is uh, apropos. And then uh, just this kind of general, like Vonnegut uses science in a more sciencey way in general, I think. Yeah. Uh, but there's, there is kind of a sense of like, you know, we're all kind of doomed, but you kind of have to do the best you can. But um, in the end, it's probably all for nothing, <laughs> which is not so dissimilar t- to this book, I would say. I don't know how much else I have to say about it, but uh, I would, if like Carrie, you have not read any Kurt Vonnegut, uh, I would say that the the one that I really thought was great uh, was Slaughterhouse Five, which is based in part on Vonnegut's own experiences in World War II being in the army, but then is also a science fiction book and it's very influential and is funny in parts and well, whatever. I, I'm. I, you don't need me to tell you that Slaughterhouse Five is great, but I do recommend <laughs> checking it out. Um, I okay, pe- fine. I'll fucking read it eventually. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I get it. <laughs> uh, people, here's my own shameful confession regarding Vonnegut. I love it. So there, the generally um, the conventional wisdom on Vonnegut, which I have read over and over, is that. Uh, he started off great, and then at a certain point, his books just became terrible. And I have never exactly been able to tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't tell you uh, which books are bad, but I could just I, – I do recommend The Slaughterhouse Five. Um, let us talk about the end of the book, like the uh, postscript or whatever, the yeah, epilogue. One other thing I want to talk about Oh, first. yeah, yeah. We sort of talked about this a little bit, but we didn't talk about the extent of this. Okay. This book and history. So often is is telling the history of how all of this happened, this being the end of the world, his own history. But one thing he's also really obsessed with is weaving in his ancestors' history. Oh, yeah. With his own story, his great-great-great-grandfather – the other possibly gay relative in his past. Who had a pet bird. Who had a pet bird. What does this mean to you that he pulls in so much of his Polish heritage, I suppose, and his Polish history when he writes his own history? How important is that? Yeah. Uh, I admit that that was kind of puzzling to me, too. Okay. So it's not just me. So I'm asking because... I mean, I get sort of why he wants to do that. You know, he he wants to feel connected, I think, mm-hmm. to his past. You know, why, it's why he calls his son, like, his strong Polish son, um, even though, you know, the kid's at this point, you know, like, what, an eighth Polish? Yes. And, uh, you know, probably not going to Catholic school or anything anytime soon. But um, how important, how, like, why is he... So obsessed with Saint Casimir, or what, what's his? Is it Ka- yeah, Saint Ka- Casimir? Is I it think Casimir. I think it's Casimir, but it might be Casimir. So Saint Casimir and and you know his his Polish relatives and you know the extent to which he he tells the story and how would he know all those details? Of course, of his Polish relatives. Yeah, is, is that all made up? Well, the first time I read the book through, like. You know, as you're reading it, there's a lot of times where you're like, well, how can you know any of this stuff? Yeah. And then at a certain point, he says, and then after the world end, we, I went out and I found people's diaries and I read notes and things and I've pieced a lot of this together. And but so it the just first so time, happens that he found these notes and these diaries of his relatives. Yeah. So the first time through, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that I buy that. And then the second time I read it through, I was like, you know, there's still a lot of stuff here that I don't think. Yeah. You would have to, you know, were they writing in English? Do you have to translate from Polish? How is your Polish translating skill (laughs) or your Russian translating skill or, you know. I mean, maybe like his dad had some, something in in the house or something. It's possible. But even then, like, you know, if his dad had those things in the house, they probably would have been part of his childhood. Like, oh, these are, you know, 
great great uncle what the yeah. fuck's his name you know you were named after him here right. are his diaries here's your uh, great grandfather's story of his homosexual relationship with a hobo yep. back in the 30s love ya so uh so anyway um, yeah no that's it, just something that you know the fact that he kept going into such detail about these relatives and his past maybe that's part of why i'm just like austin you're full of shit i don't even know if there are any bugs well that really <laughs> goes down the rabbit hole <laughs> yeah anyway you want to talk about the ending let's talk about the ending um Wait, is there anything else first? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's a lot to talk about in this book, There's a lot. So I really recommend people read this book, um, not only because it's about giant horny uh, praying mantises, but because it's actually a really, really fucking weird, fun, odd, strange, wonderful book to read. I think it's really well written. Sentence to sentence, each sentence sounds really good. You put them together and it's all like, what the fuck am I reading? But... So far, most people, I think most everybody who has read this book by uh, by YA Book Club uh, has read this, obviously, Jacob, and I have read this together. People are like, I don't know why I shouldn't like this, but I didn't find it deplorable. And I think that's a really great like way to say that y'all should read this book. I mean, you I think won't it, find it deplorable. I mean, I think it does kind of capture... Um, you know, I think many people were, maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, were uh, teenagers who were terrible people in certain ways. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me, like, oddly enough, like this, the author is in his, you know, mid to late fifties and um, wrote this book, you know, it was just published a year ago. And um, I think this book beyond so many other books actually captures the teenage experience so much better than others because other books don't talk about being horny or, you know, being awkward about being horny and always thinking, you know, they're like, oh yeah, boys always think about sex. But this is actually like, this boy literally is always telling you what he's thinking about when he's thinking about sex. It's like, oh yeah, I saw shag carpeting and it sort of made me horny because I thought about putting my girlfriend on the shag carpeting and you're like, holy fucking shit. Like, this is accurate in a way that is uncomfortable. There was uh, one thing that I thought was funny where he's, uh, at one point he says, uh, I could see Robbie checking to see if I had an erection. So I tried to hide it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, that's something I really like about this book. And I'm, if this book has not been banned in every conservative town in this country, um, I, I hope that it is soon because that will get more kids to read it. Yeah. <laughs> because it's really, I think, important to have this stuff be okay. Like he's, you know, like I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with Robbie's volcano. Like yeah. there's nothing wrong with sexuality and there's nothing wrong with, you know, thinking about and talking about and, you know, mm -hmm. wanting sex and, and yeah. You know, that, that overwhelming drive that you have as a teenage grasshopper <laughs> praying man. It's like, you just like, I just want to fuck. That's just what I want to do. And, uh, there you yeah. have it. So I, I, I think this book is, is again, worth a read because there's so many things that are fucking weird and wonderful and grasshopper yeah. jungle is good <laughs> I, I told you uh before we were started recording that um i have a friend lucy redacted lucy redacted I, of the redacted family yeah they're a, they're an ancient and uh proud clan <laughs> um and she used to work as a sex educator in a high school yeah and i had suggested to her that she because she reads some ya i suggested that she read um one of the ones we previously discussed, Anna and the French Kiss. Which is a lovely book. Yes. Wonderful. Listen Perfect to that quiet. episode. That was a good episode. It was a good episode. I enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, I really liked the book as well. I recommended it to Lucy and she read it and she said, yeah, it was all right. As a sex educator, basically what I'm looking for in YA is I want, or in a YA romance, I want the characters to 
talk about protection, have sex, break up, and deal with the consequences. And so she's going to read this book next because there are some fucking consequences. Or some consequences to fucking. Sorry. They do all of those things in this book, sort of. Sort of. Um, So after the world ended and Robbie becomes a god to the bugs, um, occasionally, especially in winter, uh, when the bugs sort of go into hibernation, he, uh, Austin... And, and Robbie, they go out on what they call cigarette runs and they stay in lovely hotels and they get cigarettes and they do whatever it is they're supposed to do. Um, they, uh, they, they fuck a lot is what we're assuming. Correct. Uh, maybe, I don't know. They don't ever explicitly say it, but we're sort of assuming. Austin says he's still confused, but he doesn't, he's decided that's okay. Yeah. Um, so they go on these cigarette runs where, you know, they, they get supplies they find you know dead polish relatives diaries um, yeah robbie always brings back a rolex for shan yeah which is a joke which is the worst joke ever i don't know at some point give it up <laughs> enough with the rolexes yeah four is enough and you know sometimes they kill a a, a rogue bug um, yeah. that just happens to be around uh, because they do always um have uh, the paint guns. The paint guns full of full of blood, uh, ready and to go. And they get a cup of noodles. Yeah. One thing that they don't ever get that mm-hmm. will always bother me until the end of time, because Austin is the fucking worst and I hate him. <laughs> He's a shitty human being. Shan's stepfather, Johnny, He's fucking crazy now. He's down in this bunker and he's been in this bunker for years and he keeps trying to make contact with people, like holding out some serious fucking hope in this bunker that he could get out of the bunker at some point and like go back in the world. It's just the way it was before he went down. And one thing that he really wants that he talks about a lot is being able to watch gun smoke. Fucking Austin never thinks, not once, in the many years he and Robbie have gone out on these cigarette runs, has not fucking once, sorry y'all, I needed to yell, thought to go get this motherfucker some goddamn Gunsmoke DVDs. He could pick up a fucking tiny little portable DVD player if he wanted to. Easy. This guy could walk around with his gun smoke DVDs and fucking forget that he's in this bunker and it's the end of the fucking world. But Austin's the worst. Austin's a shit heel. And Austin is selfish and hasn't considered once to get this guy these fucking DVDs. But he writes in his little fucking history diary about how Johnny would love to watch Gunsmoke. So it's not like he doesn't know that this guy wants to fucking watch Gunsmoke. Austin is the worst. The jury rests. If I could drop this mic, I would. <laughs> oh, it's tough. You could. <laughs> um, yeah, I have no... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I needed to rant because that, that just really bothered me. And that, you know... I say like, oh, he's he's not the he's not the worst. He's not the worst. You know, he's confused. Uh, Carrie, stop lying to yourself. I really wonder a lot. I mean, Austin doesn't talk a lot about life in the bunker, and it's hard to tell. Like, yeah. I wonder what is because does really no one else want to leave the bunker? That seems hard for me to believe. Yeah, because if it's winter, you think Robbie could take everyone out for a spin. Yeah, you know, like, oh, I'll go out with my you know with my friend. And then I'll take you out, and then I'll take you out, or th- well, all three of us will go out. Yeah, I mean, they can presumably get more paint guns. Yeah, I mean, I guess he probably doesn't want to get sucked completely dry, but uh, you know. Well, I mean, that's you can what- store it. Grady got sucked pretty dry. He had a whole room full of it, didn't he? Yeah, but then he got kind of sick as a result. I think. <laughs> well, also Grady had also a room full of his sperm. So he did. This is true. <laughs> oh, like I enjoyed that. You know, he collected sperm from the president and from the Pope. I like the, the Pope. He got this Pope to <laughs> masturbate into the- a jar <laughs> and then threw the sperm away later and replaced it with his own. That is ballsy. <laughs> yeah. 
Good word. <laughs> Sorry. That was the worst pun ever. I apologize wholeheartedly. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, that last chapter or postscript or whatever yes. seems like the most kind of unbelievable in the sense of I don't believe that in the world of the book that that's exactly what it's really like, especially for the other people in the bunker. Yeah. Um, so Austin and Shan had sex one time in the bowling alley. Yes. As you do. And were there consequences? Yes. Uh, they had a baby. The pancake chef and Robbie's mom have a daughter. Yeah. So if they're going to repopulate the world. Yep. Got two kids. That's it. There you go. You're fucked. <laughs> they don't quite have the same um, output. No, as the grasshoppers. A, that the, the praying uh, mantises do. Mantises. So, uh, so they, yeah. when they're out exploring, they find they come across a herd of deer who are no longer afraid of humans. Yeah. The bugs don't eat deer. I would assume that the bugs eat everything. So that was a little weird to me. Right. Maybe the bugs have died down quite a bit for some reason. It's possible. I mean, because it seems like they Maybe their balls fell off finally. Yeah, that's right. They ate too much of that uh, unstoppable <laughs> corn. Um, I don't know if you can still get them, but apparently you could get unstoppable corn uh, t-shirts as a I think promotional you can, item. Cause I, I actually went looking for one. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Tempting. Austin's like, I'm never going to eat corn again. <laughs> Well, I don't know what my train of thought was exactly. Oh, yeah, I just wondered about the deer and the yeah, buffalo. Yeah, and I think... Uh, but I guess, yeah. So but, but, we were also talking about, do we think that the entire world, like, everyone is dead now? Or? No, I think they're not. I think it's impossible for them to be because prank mantises don't swim. So I think North and South America, okay, pretty pretty well covered. You know, possibly just North America if we're talking about, you know, them not crossing the canal. Right. But as far as the rest of the world, likely not um, because they can't deal with cold. So they're not going to, you know, cross any ice bridge. Yeah. They they can't swim. I mean, just bugs just can't swim. They're terrible swimmers. Um, right. I mean, some bugs, obviously. Some bugs can carry. Some bugs can swim. Don't lie. Your your history is bad, um, but but have you ever seen a, a, a praying mantis like doing the doggy paddle? Those arms, they're, they're, they can't do it. No, that's true. Um, they might or might not be able to fly. We had an argument about that. I don't think that they can. Hold my mic. I'm going to Google this shit. Okay. Keep talking. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm googling this, y'all. This is important. I need to know, can praying mantises fly? Oh, I'm going to ask Siri. <laughs> can praying mantises fly? Let me check that. Here's what I found on the web for can praying mantises fly. Oh, most adult praying mantids I'm have not wings. Sure what you said. <laughs> Oops, try that again. Most adult praying mantids have wings. Some species do not. Females usually cannot fly with their wings, but males can. So... If only dudes can fly, they're not going to last very long. True. So we're still doing okay. Yes. So I mean, they pr they're not going to be able to fly across like the Atlantic Ocean. They're not going to be able anyway. to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. Maybe they can fly across the locks down to South America. Right. So two continents are gone. Yeah, two continents are probably gone. But I would say that the rest of the world is probably like. What the fuck is going on with the United States? What the fuck is going on with Brazil? What the fuck is going on with Canada? But I, but I think they're okay. Right. And I th I think I agree, except I feel like there are a couple of things that are concerning. Tell me about these things that are concerning. The one is just on a general note. I feel like the general one of the themes of the book is that uh, it only takes a few people doing stupid things and some weird coincidences. So, like... If a mantis got onto a plane just right before it took off or something. So you think somebody glowing red was going on a plane? Right. And then the glowing red is the other thing because at one point they go, you know, when they're um, going out and they're going to try to stop the infestation before everything really goes to hell. They encounter these two cops on a bridge or soldiers. Maybe. Yeah. 
and one of them is glowing red. When you look at it through the lemur mask, and uh, red means dead. Red means that you're going to turn into a bug, and they don't know how that guy got infected. Yeah, and so you know there may be a source of infection that's not the original source, and we're not sure exactly where it is or how it works. And also, um, they said that there were. You know, Johnny had one of the big globes of plague in his in the back room of his yeah. uh, antique. But they said that uh, four globes were given to the U.S. government and are locked away someplace. So who knows what happened to those? But they're still the United States. I mean, maybe, probably, possibly, probably. Well, maybe you know, maybe the vice president took one. Uh, when then, then we're fucked. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I still feel the rest of the world is probably safe, but I feel like there's some uncertainty. Okay, fine. Some uncertainty, but Australia's doing okay. Yeah, Australia, I'll give you. <laughs> I'll give you Australia. New Zealand, maybe even better. Yeah. Um, Madagascar. I mean, Australia's, you know, fucked it up as it is with giant bugs and, and whatnot. So oh, that's true. I think they'll just be business as usual. Same <laughs> amount of fun. <laughs> That's true. The the snakes will uh, yeah. fight off the yeah. The snakes will eat those bugs. They wouldn't even think twice. Yeah. Uh, so, is there anything else we should say about this book? Read it. That's what I want to say. Yeah, um, I agree. I, know, I, I I I say a lot of sort of negative things about this book. Everyone is horrible. Um, giant horny bugs. Like doesn't sound all that appealing, but it's really really well written and a really. Really fascinating look into the mind and uh, hoardiness of a teenage boy. Amen. Yay. So, uh, yeah, so that was our discussion of Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith. So what are, uh, well, I guess we already said what we're going to talk about next. But well, we can talk about it again. We're going to read uh, the second book in the His Dark Material series. We're going to read The Subtle Knife, uh, Philip Pullman. Um, so I recommend... Um, since you've all already read the first book, um, that you want to continue on and read the second book of the series. Right. So the first book was The Golden Compass, and you can go back and find that episode if you're so inclined, uh, if you haven't heard it already. And, uh, yeah, so good. Um, I'm looking forward to reading that. I read it long enough ago that I kind of forget what happened. I it. forgot a lot of it. Like, I was, I was actually reading a plot synopsis last night because I was like, is that the one where... I think that's the one where, huh, yeah. a lot of different characters that I don't even remember. This yeah. is going to be fun. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to reading that again. Yeah. So we don't have any reader mail this time. That's alas, okay. But if you want to send us something and if you don't say otherwise, we'll probably read it on a future episode and respond to it there. Uh, then you can send us email at podcast at loveyoulikecrazy.com or you can comment on Facebook or Twitter. Oh, I started a Goodreads page for us. A Goodreads Did you now? Yeah. I need to remember my Goodreads password now. Sure. <laughs> so uh, I've posted some of the past episodes there and um, I'll post about upcoming books and things and if, you know, you can comment there or whatever you want. And let's see. My brain has gone blank. That's what this book will do to you. Oh, uh, we have a bonus episode, which we've already recorded. Yeah, of like maybe the worst movie I've seen in a long time. Yes, and that was... Uh, Vampire Va Academy. Yeah. And it's based on a YA book that I have not read, but uh, Jacob and, and me and my friend Sarah, we sat down in this glorious basement that we are currently in. Uh, we're all uh, trapped here, actually, uh, bunker style. No, um... We all watched Vampire Academy and wished we hadn't. Yeah. So then, uh, our loss is your gain. <laughs> and we uh, immediately recorded <laughs> ourselves talking about it for around 20 minutes or so. So I'll put that out hopefully in a week or two. And you can listen to that and uh, hopefully enjoy it. We had a good time recording it. We did. It was nice to meet Sarah. She's a good people. I like her. Yeah. So I, I guess that's about it. I'm going to be heading back to Providence tomorrow. Stupid Providence all the way up north. Yeah. Stupid. But it's, Far away. It's been great seeing you in person. And it has been great. And I love you like crazy. I do. I love you like crazy too. I mean, I love ya like mm -hmm. crazy. Let's not go get crazy. I know. Or wait, what? Okay. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> and just cheesy. like that. <laughs> just like that, everything devolves into a fucking cheese fest. It all goes to hell. This is where it starts, people. Yeah. 
bugs. bugs. We're dead. All right. Well, tune in next time <laughs> if we aren't all eaten by giant praying mantises. And uh, we'll talk about uh, the Philip Fulton book. So long. Bye. My brother's at the store. A genius when he's bored. He contemplates his consciousness. He feels his hands, they sweat. He can't connect it yet. He pools all his resources. And he calls up the insects he commands. And the water bugs attack the policemen. Brothers at the morgue, he gets up off the floor and contemplates his escape. But there's a guard at the door, he feels his power soar, and he pools all his resources, and he calls. the policeman Now he's on his way back home So he stops to use the phone Cause he can't remember But there's a cop back at his car So he needs his friends once more He pools all his resources And he calls up The insects he commands And the water bugs Attack the policemen Attack the policemen. Love, I, I, crazy.com.